What's up, everybody? My name is Matt Specht, and today I'm going to be talking about the 2008 Italian film Gamora, directed by Matteo Garoni. Specifically, I want to chat about the way Garoni references the works of several famous artists throughout the film. First, let me tell you a little bit about the film. Yes, there are spoilers ahead. Gamora is a mafia film set in the Campania region of southern Italy. Based on the book by Roberto Saviano, the film follows five allegedly true stories, all loosely connected in one way or the other, to the Camorra Crime Syndicate, which is one of the oldest and largest crime organizations in Italy, roots dating back as far as the 17th century. Five stories, in no particular order, are uh, Toto, a kid of maybe 14 or so, who wants to join the Camorra. He begins the movie as a grocery delivery boy, but gets caught in the middle of Camorra's war with another crime organization. We have Marco and Sweet Pea, slightly older kids of about 17 or so. These guys are small-time crooks who, instead of joining the Camorra, they attempt to branch out on their own. However... They quickly run afoul of the better established, better funded, and much better armed Camorra and pay for those mistakes with their lives. We have Franco, a slick, middle aged businessman who disposes of toxic chemical waste for legitimate businesses by dumping the waste in the lands of poor private local farmers. He is conned by telling the farmers he's, on he's only dumping garbage. We have Don Chiro, who is uh, sort of the opposite of Franco. He's a nervous and slightly disheveled bagman, delivering weekly allowance from the mob to the families of their jailed of the mob's jailed members. And then finally, we have Pasquale. He's an incredibly talented tailor working for a garment factory run by the Camorra. Legend has it that some of the highest fashion in the world is produced by Italian garment factories run by the mob. Pasquale takes on a side job working for a competing garment factory run by a Chinese family. Now, when the Camorra find out about this, they gun Pasquale down as he's leaving the other factory after a night's work. He doesn't die, but he's injured, and he is forced into hiding as a truck driver to make ends meet. Now, the film was shot on location in and around the Campania region of Italy, using amateur and non-professional actors, some of whom were real-life gangsters and have since spent time in real-life jail. <laughs> Garoni does almost all of his own camera work using a handheld camera and taking long, uninterrupted shots, which give the film this uh, a preternatural grittiness and authenticity, almost as if the film is more real than reality. Gamora won the 2008 Grand Prix at Cannes Film Festival, along with nearly three dozen other European film awards. Director Matteo Garoni was born in 1968, the son of a theater critic and a photographer. He went to art school in the 1980s, and the impact his art training has had on his directing is pretty undeniable. What I want to look at today is the way he uses the works of six famous painters to help him tell the five stories in Gamora. Francis Bacon, M.C. Escher, Baltus, René Magritte, Caravaggio, and Mark Rothko. Now, there are plenty of instances where directors have used or referenced art and painting in film already. Uh, Tarantino uses Thomas Gainsborough's Blue Boy in Django Unchained. Peter Weir referenced Magritte to brilliant effect at the end of The Truman Show. And Christopher Nolan famously recreated M.C. Escher's Ascending and Descending in Inception. And then recreated German artist Caspar David Friedrich's 1818 painting Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog for his World War II epic Dunkirk. And these are just the tip of the iceberg. Check the uh, description for more links. Now, don't get me wrong. These examples are amazing. But in my humble opinion, Garoni takes these things to the next level and does something that I think is far more interesting. Instead of simply copying specific paintings or recreating them for the scene, Garoni references an artist's entire body of work to emphasize the stories, stories he's telling. It's like he captures the vibe of these works. It adds a layer of depth, nuance, and understanding to each of these five stories, and that ultimately makes for a much more compelling film, especially for a guy like me who has uh, been known to sling paint at canvas from time to time. All right, let's dive right in. Garoni bookends his film by taking a cue from the works of Irish painter Francis Bacon. Bacon is one of my all-time favorites. He's been called tortured, shocking, eccentric, 
Here he is posing in 1963 for Vogue magazine with a split carcass of meat. <laughs> and that's really what he's most known for, reducing the human body to pieces of meat. Here's his 1962 triptych, Three Studies for a Crucifixion. Bright, almost garish colors brutally juxtaposed with piles of meat. By showing us bodies as meat, Bacon is always asking us, what is it to be human? In his 1976 Vultures triptych, Bacon wonders if maybe our bodies are not just meat, maybe our bodies are nothing more than food for someone or something else to consume. These triptychs are huge, by the way. Here they are on display at auction a couple of years ago, right before they sold for a record $86 million. In the film, Garoni's pre credit scene is a group of gangsters assassinated while they're tanning in a tanning salon. The title card rolls, and then Garoni returns to the dead bodies crumpled in the tanning booths. Garoni, like Bacon, shows us bodies as meat, lit in eye-popping detail by the tanning lights, stripped of all humanity. In the final scene at the end of the movie, Groni cranks Bacon's work to 11. Marco and Sweet Pea get assassinated. Instead of reducing their bodies to one of Bacon's pieces of meat, though, or food for vultures, the gangsters load the teenagers' bodies into a front end loader for disposal. Garoni is suggesting that we're not just meat, we are trash. Interesting side note that picture from Vogue inspired Bacon to paint this which ended up in another movie you may have seen. I kind of like this one, Bob. <laughs> Tim Burton, you sly devil, you. All right, next up is Dutch painter and illustrator M.C. Escher. He's most well known for pieces like his self-portrait hand with reflecting sphere and other optical trickery like Sky and Water 1. If your 10-year-old Matthew Michael Specht, Escher is known for his waterfall lithograph, which hung on the wall to the right of the family piano. I spent many hours looking at every line of that print instead of practicing the piano. Garoni uses Escher's perspective three or four times throughout the movie. Early on, our youngest character, Toto, sees some gangsters drop a gun and some drugs while being chased by the cops. He retrieves the guns in an effort to ingratiate himself with the local gangsters. Garoni follows Toto as he races through his apartment complex, keeping Toto squarely in the middle of the frame. But as Toto climbs, Garoni subtly pans the camera away from Toto to show us the underside of the apartment complex. And then he returns our focus onto Toto. It's not accidental. Garoni is making a point here by referencing many of Escher's architectural absurdities like Ascending Descending, My Childhood Companion Waterfall, and most specifically, Relativity. Escher asks us, which way is up? Where are the subjects going? What is the point of all that effort if they are just going to go around in circles? But instead of merely recreating an optical illusion, Garoni places us inside the scene. Instead of observing the subjects in an Escher print, Garoni forces us to ask ourselves, how do we know where we're going in life? Where is our moral compass? In this scene, we see some gangsters doing some gangster shit, as Jules Winfield once put it, but then Garoni shows us a wedding in progress. He taps into Escher's vibe again here. We are all characters in an Escher print, going around in circles, never making real progress or headway despite our best efforts. Third on my list is Baltus. During his lifetime, Baltus was friends with Italian filmmaker Federico Fellini, briefly appeared in Thomas Harris's novel Hannibal as Hannibal Lecter's cousin, and Bono even sang at his funeral. As a painter, though, Baltus was known for his problematic depictions of young girls. Back in the mid to late 20th century, this did not raise many eyebrows, but museums and galleries have come under fire recently for putting Baltus on display, and with good reason. Some of Baltus' most famous pieces, like Therese Dreaming and Girl with Cat, show underage girls lounging about in sexually suggestive poses, looking in the mirror, getting dressed, seemingly unaware of their own sexuality and impending adulthood. More importantly, they are unwitting participants in their own exploitation and possibly even their own victimization. I mean, look at this pic from 1993. It's fucking creepy. I can almost guarantee you that had Baldus lived a couple more years into this century, he would have ended up meeting Chris Hansen on TV. What are you doing here today? 
Now, in Gamora, Garoni shows us Toto as he plucks his eyebrows, contemplating himself in the mirror. Later, we see him studying the bruise he received after he was shot during the Gamora's violent initiation ritual. Now, Baltus's girls seemed unaware of their own impending adulthood, but Toto is just beginning to become aware. And Garoni keeps pushing us along these lines and shows Toto starting to look at his surroundings in search of his adulthood instead of the mirror. Here we see Marco and Sweepy looking around corners, poking their heads up through floorboards, actively hunting down their adulthood. The tragedy, of course, is that all three boys are still naive, completely unaware that they are actively participating in their own victimization, exploitation, and ultimately their own deaths. Garoni gives us a slightly more traditional cinematic tip of the hat to Baltus's painting The Room, which itself was a recreation of a centuries-old painting called The Nightmare by Henry Fuseli. In this scene, we see Franco arguing with a poor farm family who are dealing with the consequences of the toxic waste Franco has dumped on their land. Light is coming in from the same direction in the painting. The color scheme is similar, and the subject in bed is suffering from a devil close enough to reach out and touch. One of Garoni's more obvious and specific artistic references is Belgian surrealist René Magritte. Magritte once said that paint is for the canvas, not the floor, and uh, <laughs> it kind of looks like he's a guy that would say something like that. <laughs> One of his most famous pieces, of course, is The Treachery of Images. Translated, uh, uh, that line on the painting says, this is not a pipe. We get it, bro. It's a painting, not a pipe. Back then, it was very clever. Garoni uses Magritte's carte blanche to piggyback on the themes he's explored already with Marco and Sweet Pea. In the painting, we're not sure where the horse and rider end and the force begins. In the scene, the two boys are searching for guns they've hidden after stealing them from the Camorra. Garoni is asking us, where does childhood end and where does adulthood begin? Are these two dipshits smart enough to figure it out? <laughs> I don't know. You better believe Garoni knows his art history, too. Here we have my man, Caravaggio. Caravaggio was an Italian painter from the late 16th and early 17th century. While he was alive, he was almost as famous for his drinking, fighting, and fucking as he was for his painting. I mean, look at that rapscallion. He looks hungover and still ready to fight you. He was a criminal, too, ending up in court almost a dozen times, including a conviction for killing the son of a rich family when they were fighting over a prostitute. Some people believe Caravaggio died at the hands of assassins hired to avenge the wealthy man's death. Who knows, maybe Caravaggio ran into an early iteration of the Camorra. His paintings are even more breathtaking than his personal life. He was one of the first painters to master a method called tenebrism, which is a more intense version of chiaroscuro. Basically, Caravaggio was a badass when it came to the use of lighting and high contrast for dramatic effect. Here we have David with the head of Goliath, the beheading of St. John the Baptist, and the beheading of Holofernes. The model Caravaggio used for Judith in this painting is said to be the same prostitute he fought that guy over. But are you seeing this theme? Violent moments caught in dramatic lighting. Garoni deftly executes the same technique when we watch Toto get initiated into the mob. High contrast illuminating an incredibly violent scene for maximum dramatic effect. Get this. The man shooting Toto here was later convicted in real life of drug dealing and extortion. Finally, and arguably Garoni's most clever and heartbreaking use of art and art history, he puts painter Mark Rothko into motion on the screen. Rothko was a member of the Abstract Expressionist movement along with guys like Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, and my personal favorite, Robert Motherwell. Rothko was known for his glowing color fields on huge canvases. These blocks of color seem to just vibrate right off the canvas and sear themselves right in your eyeballs. Rothko actually recommended that viewers position themselves 18 inches from the canvas so that the painting would completely envelop the viewer. Now, before we get to what Garoni does in the movie, I need to tell you a little story about Rothko. One of Rothko's first big commissions was from the Seagram's Beverage Company back in 1958. Seagram's had just built a shiny new skyscraper on Park Avenue in New York. They commissioned 40 paintings and murals from Rothko to decorate their luxury Four Seasons restaurant. 
Luckily, uh, Rothko knew which Four Seasons he was supposed to be installing these paintings, and he got right to work. He could be irascible, though, and uh, confided to a friend that he intended to paint, and I quote, something that will ruin the appetite of every son of a bitch who ever eats in that room. <laughs> I think him and Caravaggio would have been drinking buddies. Eventually, though, the thought of his work in a restaurant, no matter how luxurious, was too much for Rothko to bear. He publicly declared the atmosphere at the Four Seasons pretentious, inappropriate for his paintings, stopped work on the project, and actually even returned the cash advance he had already received. But what to do with the paintings he had already completed? Twelve years later, Rothko sold them to the prestigious Tate Gallery in London. But the day the murals arrived, Rothko committed suicide. Garoni's master tailor Pasquale suffers a similar, similar fate. After the mob's assassination attempt, Pasquale is forced into hiding as a truck driver. In a truck stop late one night, Pasquale glances at a TV and sees Scarlett Johansson on the red carpet, wearing a dress Pasquale himself has made. This is how Garoni breaks my heart with his command of art and art history. In a prior scene, Pasquale's car gets shot to hell and the car crashes into a cemetery. And there it is. A glowing block of light just like a Rothko painting, 18 inches away from your nose. A tragic scene completely enveloping you on what should have been one of the best days of your life. But instead of suicide, Pasquale's punishment is arguably far worse. He has to live long enough to see someone else take credit for his life's work. Time and again throughout this film, Garoni uses art to add depth dimension and nuance to the grim and gritty stories he tells. Are we, as humans, just meat for someone else to consume, or are we trash? Is the transition from childhood to adulthood merely exploitative, or is it a violent act? Are the passions that motivate us noble pursuits, or mindless busy work meant to keep our minds occupied while someone else takes all the credit? The way Garoni uses art is nothing short of a master stroke of genius, and the result is a work of art all its own. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Yeah.